Hi, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. My name is uh, Sebastian Philippe. I'm now a fifth year uh, graduate student at Princeton, hopefully finishing soon. Um, as Alex mentioned, uh, we live in a time where uh, politically it's difficult to uh, you know, come up with new ideas for new agreements or uh, go to the negotiation table. So meanwhile, uh, I think it's, it's a great opportunity uh, to come up with some new uh, crazy ideas where I kind of like, you know, try to think outside the box or think about, you know, is there a box? Um, so today I will uh, introduce you to a very exciting project that we've started uh, this year. Um, and the title of my talk, On-Site Inspections from a Distance. What I will talk about today is the application of virtual proofs of reality, which is a cryptographic context concept, to nuclear safeguards and arms control um, verification. But first, let me give you a little bit of background. We know that treaties require credible information generating mechanisms. Uh, we know that because that's how we can verify that uh, partners, treaty partners, actually. Um, follow their obligations and are, uh, that all partners are actually confident that everyone is uh, not cheating or actually uh, working uh, as they're supposed to work. Um, in the nuclear verification realms, on-site inspections have always been a key mechanism uh, as, you know, to, to generate this kind of information. But the problem with on-site inspections is that it is often, if not always, a contentious point of negotiations. If you look at, back at the you know, old treaty negotiations history, every time people will run into problems saying, you know, what can we actually measure? Uh, when can I come? How many times a year can I come to make a measurement? Um, and that's, you know, that's basically bring the, the, the problem uh, of trying to find acceptable solutions for all partners uh, to uh, negotiate uh, treaties. Especially because physical measurements in sensitive locations as we run into when we uh, negotiate arms control agreements or non-proliferation agreements uh, require trusted equipment. That is equipment um, that both inspector and host are happy to work with because they know that they cannot be used to access uh, information that the host would not like to share, and from the inspector perspective, that he can actually trust the data that is acquiring. Classically, this has been done um, a lot, especially uh, when trying to avoid going uh, in the sensitive locations themselves by setting up remote verification that require tamper-proof hardware. That means being sure that there's no way for the host um, to tamper with the equipment, uh, but also cryptographic keys and digital signatures that are often placed inside the box with the sensor device uh, to make sure that uh, the data is signed and uh, trustworthy from an, uh, the inspector point of view. What I would like us to do today is um, try to think about another solution to this problem. Because if we keep only going the way we've been doing, I think we'll run into untractable problems at the negotiation table. Um, so today I will introduce uh, you know, virtual proofs of reality. And what this concept offer here is a way to prove physical statements remotely um, and without using a classical tamper-resistant hardware and cryptographic keys. What does this mean in simple terms? I think we can eventually verify, make physical measurements in places when we have either zero access or extremely limited access. And so how do we do that? Uh, it's kind of crazy, so what I will do is I will walk you, you know, through very uh, kind of like toy examples to give you a sense of how we can actually do that. The first step, which is the most important one, um, is to 
turn physical sensors into physical one-way functions. So what do I mean by that? Well, one-way functions and their physical equivalent, physical and clonable functions, are basically devices um, that produce responses when you uh, challenge them with external stimuli. Um, their properties are very important. Um, the function must be easy to evaluate, but extremely hard to predict. So in cryptography, for example, you will require that the function is easy to evaluate, but extremely hard to inverse. And we use this every day, every time we connect to the web, or uh, um, and in many different cryptographic applications. The physical equivalent here must also be easy to manufacture, but extremely hard to duplicate. And so what we do here, well, let me first, sorry. First, let me say that, and to give you a better idea of what are, are those physical and clonable functions, uh, you can find them in two flavors, basically. Uh, they can be either electronic or non-electronic. Um, the most famous example, well, one of the most famous example, and that is also well known by our community, is uh, optical one-way functions. So in the system, basically what you do is like you shine a laser onto a transparent media that is filled up with tiny little uh, uh, reflective you know, uh, spheres and you are able to measure an interference pattern coming out and uh, from that interference pattern uh, generate cryptographic keys and because the media is so complex and the interaction between light and matter is uh, extremely difficult to simulate, uh, this creates a very strong mechanisms uh, to create uh, unique keys. Um, the second option that you have when you want to use PATH um, is to implement uh, logic uh, inside integrated circuits such as also a, a film programmable gate arrays. Um, and here we have like a, a commercial product by off the shelf and we bought some in the lab. And although, you know, thousands of them are manufactured, you can come up with implementing logics inside them that makes them, each pieces make them unique. Um, and based on that uniqueness, you can actually authenticate every piece of hardware that you would use inside your sensor equipment. But what we do here, we don't plug a sensor to you know, electronics from which we'll do some data acquisition or everything. We actually turn the physical system, the physical inclinable sensor into, well, sorry, the physical inclinable uh, function into a sensor, or vice versa. So what I mean by that, it's like we look for systems that not only responds to some uh, st external stimuli or challenges, but also to physical quantities. So that the response you end up uh, with um, is a function of both. And by doing that, you can create challenge response pairs and tables that are dependent on physical quantities. So then the next step is to actually use the sensors into interactive protocols uh, to come up with uh, proof of a physical measurement. So some very uh, simple general assumptions here. Uh, and there's nothing else. There is a prover at location one and a verifier at uh, location two. And there are, you know, they can be in two different countries. The only thing that is between them is a communication channel, which can be an open communication channel, and there's no security uh, assumptions on this uh, communication line. Um, and what we do here, uh, and this is a particular example where we have a private setup phase, where here what, what we have is the verifier uh, creates what I will call witness objects, which is basically the, the sensor physical and clinical sensors, and it creates a bunch of them, and it prepares list of challenge response pairs, uh, constructed, constructed so that um, you get response for a particular challenge at a given physical quantity. So if you were to measure temperatures, you take this uh, chip 
and you run some challenges, you get some response at a particular temperature, and you create a gigantic table like this. Then what you do is uh, you can transfer the ownership, complete custody of the object to the prover. That means you can do anything you want. So you can try to attack, hack it, anything. Um, but because it's a physical and clonable function, it will, not, it will basically not be able uh, to come up with, how to say, to, to try to, I mean, it will not necessarily be able to uh, defeat, defeat it by simulating, trying to simulate that function because it's so hard to simulate. Um, so how does this work? I'm trying to find of a good example here. Um, so last summer we went uh, to the DAF, make measurement on uh, HEU, and that was quite an amazing experience. And Jason was, was there to organize everything. Uh, and so uh, let's say that today, you know, we know that how uh, difficult it is to actually go there. Uh, so maybe uh, we could try to make measurements inside the DAF without me being in the DAF. Uh, and the way uh, we would do that, we would set up things with Jason. And let's say I want just to measure temperature of an object, which is a very simple concept. And what I would do is I will, I will call Jason and say, OK, what's the temperature today in the DAF? And then he will say, well, Sebastian, today it's 20 degrees Celsius. How do I trust Jason? Of course I trust Jason. But let's say, in this context, I don't really trust him. Uh, so what I would do, I would look up at my table and say, OK, what, is the, what are the challenges that I can send him that corresponds to the temperature at 20 degrees Celsius? Then I will send him my challenge over the phone, you know, totally I mean, you know, not a secure communication, what I mean. I send him the challenge, he used the challenge, he, he challenged my uh, sensor, and then he sent me back the response, and then I look up if the response corresponds to the expected one that I had in my table. And if it, do, if it does, then I accept the proof that the temperature is actually 20 degrees. Um, and what I, what I also do is like, I remove that challenge response pair from my list so I don't re, uh, reuse it. Uh, the next day. Um, so, to give you a better idea of still, you know, with this toy example of uh, temperature, how we would do that, well, we actually did it uh, in uh, May, June. Uh, and the way we did is uh, we use a very uh, funny uh, logical system that we coded uh, on an FPGA, uh, which is a bicycle ring. And so the way it works is very simple, is you have inverters. Inverters are one of the basic, basic logic gates. It, uh, if you feed them, you know, input them high, they output low. If you input low, you uh, they output high. And what you do is like you create rings of them uh, so that uh, for a four bits example here, uh, the only stable outcomes would be 0, 1, 0, 1, or 1, 0, 1, 0, OK? So then what we do here is that we create those rings and we force them, every connection between them to low, which is very unstable for this type of logic gates. Um, and when you release that forcing to uh, this unstable state, then uh, it's going, the ring is going to fall either on the stable state A and the stable state B. And uh, you can believe me because we have papers and some peer review uh, um, data also uh, from other groups. Uh, this is chip dependent. So one FPGA, same manufacturer, same series, is going to give different results. It's reproducible and it's also temperature dependent. So that here we use this puff with, which is uh, quite famous in the field and turn it into a temperature sensor. Uh, and we tried that. We tried this over 24 hours at different temperatures, uh, fitting up constantly challenges, and uh, trying to see if it was actually reproducible and how well we could do that. So temperature is nice, of course, but what we are really interested in here is uh, you know, radiation measurement device. So can we go on to that step? Uh, and here is my second example of a virtual proof of neutron non-irradiation. Can we prove that an object has not been exposed to neutron without seeing it and without being there? Um, 
And so how I would do that, well, you remember I just presented the idea of using a laser onto uh, transparent media that is filled up with reflective particles, uh, a system that also been used at Sandia to, to build tags and seals. Uh, but here, instead of using reflective uh, spheres, solid spheres, I use uh, Francesco Derico uh, famous bubble detectors at Yale um, to do the same feats. Uh, those detectors basically are emulsions of tiny little droplets uh, inside uh, aqueous gel matrix. And when you expose them to neutrons, bubbles pop out, you know, uh, microscopic bubbles. So they are going to change the droplet fields all around them, and they are gonna, going to change the optical properties of the medium. Uh, so using this, what, basically what I'm able to do is um, to shine a laser on the detectors, measure the interference pattern, use a transform like a Gabor transform to obtain the bit strings, do this at different height, uh, Z, and angles, to basically scan the detector. And then I, once I've done this, I can hand it over to you, or we can install it somewhere where I want to make sure that no neutron source passed by. Um, and then I don't need to be there anymore to look at the results. Uh, meaning that what I will do is then I would call you and say, okay, can you shine the laser at, at theta equal, you know, 65 degrees and Z equal like 2.5 centimeters, uh, check the interference pattern and tell me what it is. And then I will check in my list that uh, indeed nothing has changed because no neutrons has changed the fields of droplets or added more microscopic bubbles to the detector. Okay. So what are potential applications here? Uh, two very simple examples. But I think there are really, really cool things that we can do with this. Uh, first, challenge inspections from a distance. I, don't, I can do challenge inspections now without going into the places where, that I want to inspect. I can just have sensors in some places, and on Tuesday morning I call you and I say, okay, can you measure that data for me? And whatever you, know, you send me back, you can verify that it's actually trust, you know, trustworthy. Um, second is chain of custody and continuity of knowledge. We have, um, we're in contact in a group that is actually coming up with an ID, or has come up with an ID, of how to verify that object inside a room has not been moved without inspector needing to go there, without using cameras or anything like this. Uh, perimeter control, you know, radiation source has moved somewhere. Uh, and last, uh, an important point also, data commitment. Uh, data commitment is important because sometimes, especially, um, especially for imaging applications, uh, what happens is that the host may want to see the data before it shares it with uh, the inspectors. And beyond lens control, and this is my last slide, I'm down, I think the bigger picture here is how can we build trusted sensor networks uh, with very cheap, you know, uh, cost off the shelf, you know, FPGAs and things like this. Thank you very much. For example, uh, if you are looking at satellite images of uh, 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 deliveries and shipments out of a particular facility, as in our previous project, then uh, having these types of very efficient and high